The S&P 500 regional banking index is now down over 30% as a result of the challenges being faced by the banking industry as a whole, especially the regional banking industry. And now, you know, people are calling for the fact that there's another domino to fall, which is the fact that you have a lot of commercial real estate debt that may not necessarily perform the way that it has in the past. And so there's some real risk. And Barron's actually just recently released an article where they compiled a list of 15 banks banks whose specialty is lending in the commercial real estate market. But my question is, is there a situation here where you could potentially be throwing out the baby with the bathwater? In other words, are there some hidden opportunities? That's what I'm going to try to investigate in this video. And so guys, as you smash that like button, let me run that intro. What's up, guys, and welcome back to the channel. Let's dive right into this one because it's pretty incredible how much the regional banking sector share prices have declined. So you can see here that as of the recording of this video, the Spider S&P Regional Banking ETF is now down 31%. And you know, I'm saying that although regional banks are down 31%, another shoe could potentially drop with office real estate loans. And everybody knows this. It's now being talked about quite a bit. In the last uh, investor meeting, that we had on this channel because we have those monthly meetings with the patreons at that higher tier you know i was talking about the fact that a lot of people were not yet speaking about this but it's interesting how quickly the conversation has turned to you know previously the conversation was about deposit flight now with q1 earnings out we see the banks that are getting deposit flight and the banks that are not getting deposit flight there is still concern about deposit flights but even warren buffett uh recently at the um, annual general meeting for berkshire hathaway came out and said you know although they are guaranteeing the first uh, two hundred fifty thousand dollars of um uh, cash deposits with the uh, fdic Really, in reality, there's no politician who's not going to uh, uh, stop the FDIC from guaranteeing any amount above that. And that, I believe, is exactly what would happen if you have a situation where uh, banks are going under or, or a specific bank is going under and they have deposits higher than $250,000. I think depositors will be made whole in the situation. And the way that Buffett phrases is that no politician is going to come out and say, hey, you know what? I'm making the decision that, you know, all of your deposits above $250,000 are not safe. And I agree with that. And so, you know, I'm less worried about deposit um, or I'm less worried about people losing money on deposits. I'm still a little bit concerned about deposit flight, but not as much as I was previously, because I do believe that most treasury departments, most people who are worried about it have now moved their um, deposits or change their banking relationships in such a way that they're feeling comfortable now. The uh, next issue that I believe is on the horizon is if you have higher rates for longer and you have some of these loans for commercial, especially office real estate uh, spaces coming due, um, can they actually uh, refinance these things at higher rates or you know are you going to have bankruptcies there's already talks about uh, certain buildings being sold for you know a fifth of their original value uh, in uh, certain cities like San Francisco and so there's quite a bit of risk in this environment and Barron's actually came out with an article that they where they actually dug into the regional banks and they said that they found 15 banks that have a risky specialty, which is effectively uh, commercial office real estate lending. And they're saying that it isn't a problem so far. And I agree with them because, you know, you guys may recall, I actually looked through uh, 63 regional banks and I created sort of like a comps tracker, which, you know, the Patreons have access to. And what I did was as a uh, preparing that comps tracker, um, I was looking at the non-performing loans for all 63 of those banks. And, you know, Barron's is right. Uh, my experience has also been that there has been virtually no, maybe there was one, but other than that, there's virtually no banks that are experiencing material loan losses, even on their commercial real estate pro, uh, portfolios for now, at least. However, um, anybody who's followed banking um, in the past, you guys know that these loan losses, they come right away and suddenly. And the best example I would say in many of our investment lifetimes is what happened in 2008, where, you know, the, the loan losses weren't high and then all of a sudden they just spiked. And that's something that you have to pay attention to. But the only way you can really pay attention to it is you have to assess the risk before anything happens. And so that's what we're going to try to do in this uh, video here. So here's what the Barron's article said. Regional banks have received merciless scrutiny since the collapse of SVB. And so now the next worry for regional banks could be 
commercial real estate. This is great that it's now being covered. And so, you know, post pandemic changes in how we work and shop are leaving vacancies across the country. And so essentially what they're really talking about is office real estate, which is a subset of commercial real estate. So I want to like make that very clear because you're going to see um, uh, people say, oh, commercial real estate is troubled, but be very careful of like what commercial real estate is. It's a uh, all encompassing term. And like the, some of the things that you wouldn't think fall under commercial real estate would be like churches and multifamily units where, I mean, these I think are at less risk than maybe like a, an office building in a downtown of of a, a tech uh, a city like a, uh, like a San Francisco where most people are now working from home. So be very careful when the, uh, when, when the uh, business news media will, will speak about this because they may lump everything into commercial real estate and not necessarily, and, and um, you know, some of the subsets of commercial real estate don't actually have the same level of risk. So that's essentially what I'm going after here. And you know, how, how does this risk materialize? Well, the lenders in commercial real estate are mostly mid-sized banks in the bottom half of the nation's top 100 banks in assets. And so commercial real estate is their concentration. And so they're going on to say investors in over the next year will, will want to keep an eye on these local banks as they account for an estimated uh, 80% of all commercial real estate lending. And so here's the list that they comp compiled. So there's 15 banks here. Notice that PacWest is on this list. But anyways, regulators pay attention to banks in two instances. One, if commercial real estate loans exceed 300% of their capital and have grown 50% in 36 months, or if construction and development loans exceed 100% of capital. So you can see there are banks that are uh, uh, experiencing challenges here, but the one that you know stuck out to me was Bank Ozik. And notice that, you know, where, where do they uh, meet the threshold here? Well, they have three over 300% of their capital is invested in commercial real estate. However, it hasn't grown 50% in the last 36 months. And uh, so it wouldn't qualify under that one. However, um, do do commercial uh, do uh, construction and development loans exceed 100% of capital? And it does. It's 187% of capital. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to make an argument that their construction and development loans are not as risky as you would think. Um, and you know, let's we'll, we'll break down their whole commercial real estate portfolio. But this one just caught my eye as I was looking through this list. I haven't spent a lot of time on many of these banks. In fact, Bank Ozik is one that sort of um, stuck out to me as it is one that I really like. But also, um, there might be some others here that uh, I haven't uh, dug deep into. I think this one I still have to look into. PFS. Um, this one might be interesting. I'm not sure yet. Uh, I'm gonna do work on it over the next. A week or so i've done work on valley pack and etc and you know i'm not interested in those other ones but you know specifically let's dive into bank ozik now this is a bank that's liked by a lot of value investors so it's very interesting how i independently came to this one um some of the patreons were telling me that they were excited that i i picked this one out but you know it just happens to have happened the way that it did and so baron said that the third largest bank with high concentration levels in commercial real estate is bank ozik but of course because bank ozik is in their quiet period they wouldn't be able to comment on its loans and so the management team was not able to comment as they were in a blackout period but what i'll try to do is i'll comment uh, or at least provide uh, my interpretation of whether or not there's risk here so the first thing you got to do is i just pulled up their 10k and you know when uh, assessing bank risk or, or uh, bank loan portfolio risk that's not the only risk in a bank but it's just one risk to assess it's important to really look into their loan portfolios especially the areas that have uh, that seemingly have uh, more risk than usual at first glance it is true that they are highly concentrated in commercial real estate but recall guys that this is a blanket term to cover all sorts of different types of loans and uh, each loan type of loan has its own sort of like risk characteristics but the two that stuck out to me the most is this non-farm non-residential so this is basically your business loans this looks like the most riskiest line that they have to me and it's been growing the other the next one would be the construction and land development i'm not too worried about construction and land development because generally what happens with construction and land development loans um especially with banks that are um less risky or, or a little bit more risk averse is that the loans are made to cost but 
um, the buildings essentially are pr uh, virtually generally pre-sold and they're sold, of course, at a margin to the buyer. And so, you know, you might make a loan to cost at like, you know, 70%, but your loan to value might actually be in the 40s or 50%. And so, you know, if the, uh, the builder goes bankrupt, you still have quite a bit of wiggle room. And so you may not necessarily take losses on that loan because of that. And we're going to investigate that for Bank Ozik. So of their non-farm and non-residential loans, you can see that there's that 4665 figure that we were just showing in the summary schedule previously. By the way, this uh, disclosure is great that they provide. Notice that only 13.5% of their whole or like their total loan portfolio is in what I would consider the riskier area. So you have office, including medical offices. So I wish that they broke out medical offices and offices from here because I just want to know what the downtown office risk is essentially. That's kind of like what I'm looking at here. Maybe not even downtown, but just like, uh, you know, um, uh, just office in general, because so many people are working from home, are some of these buildings not as valuable anymore? And, you know, do they run into a problem? But it's not a material number is essentially what I'm trying to say. I don't know, this might be like 8%. And then hotels and motels, this is one that a lot of people aren't talking about. But if we enter into uh, a recession that kind of everybody's calling for right now, well, the first thing that businesses are going to cut is a travel and entertainment spend. And so um, if you have less travel happening at businesses, the hotels and motels could experience a challenge. Now, I don't think there is a material amount of risk overall to the portfolio, but I just wanted to point this out that it's, you know, a smaller component of the overall business. I don't see a material amount of risk in any of these other lines. Look, there's always risk but it's just about how material it is. And you are absolutely free to disagree with me. By all means, let me know in the comments below. Now, this is their construction and land development loan portfolio. This is a portfolio that generally people deem as riskier, but I think for Bank Ozik, this is not the risky one. I think the previous one was a risky one where you got 13% of your overall portfolio um, uh, dedicated to the two lines, the the um, uh, office and hotels. Now, here's the thing. If, you know, 10% of those loans go bad. Well, that just means, you know, of your total portfolio, 1.3% uh, of that whole portfolio is has gone bad. So th th that's what I mean about like um, how risk, uh, not riskless, but like how there's less risk than you would think in the overall portfolio. Now, I'm not saying that 10% of those loans would go bad. In fact, if 10% of those loans did go bad, um, what exactly is happening to the broader economy? I don't think any of us are, are doing well in that situation. So we're not worried about our investment in one particular bank but you know notice that the uh, construction and land development loans i see some office here um but this also includes medical buildings so i'm not like too concerned about this uh you are very uh diversified in terms of like what they're lending out to but like i said with construction and land development loans they loan to cost and they get that margin um, uh, relative to value. And this is what I mean. The weighted average loan to cost on their construction loans, assuming such loans are ultimately fully advanced, because remember, these are construction lines, so you draw on the uh, line of credit as you need the capital. You don't draw it all at once because it would just be too expensive as a builder, so you're very careful with when you draw it. So the loan to cost, assuming it's fully advanced, was approximately 55%. And so um, that's at cost. Remember, to value would be lower. And so you can see here the weighted average loan to value ratio on such loans based on the most recent appraisals and assuming such loans are ultimately fully advanced was approximately 44%. So you can see how in their construction loan portfolio, the loan to value, if all the loans are fully advanced, is just 44%. So you can see how um, uh, they minimize risk considerably on their construction loan portfolio. So if we go back to here, you can see that overall this 8215, their construction land development portfolio, I'm not too concerned about it. And in their non-farm, non-residential, I showed you that, you know, uh, approximately 13% of the total loan portfolio um, is in office, but it also includes medical properties and there's hotel and motels. And so, you know, even if say 10% um, of that portfolio 
uh, went bad, you're only talking about 1% of the uh, overall loan portfolio. So ultimately, I think that that Barron's article does highlight an interesting point where there are regional banks that are concentrated in commercial lending. However, you know, you really have to dig into the loan portfolios to see if there's real risk there. And you know, you have to make an assessment for yourself. And we're all going to come up with different assessments as it comes to uh, assessing the risk in these banks. Look, there are some very smart people out there who are saying, look, I am just not dealing with banks at all in this environment. And that's totally cool. I love the challenge of potentially finding uh, interesting opportunities in this market. And so I'm going headstrong and doing as much research as, as I can. I may ultimately not deploy any capital into banks, but I'm just having a lot of fun right now doing the research. And I've put hundreds and hundreds of hours into doing this research. And, you know, I, I was doing this while I was away from YouTube for a while. Um, I was all, I was sick at home, so I did, didn't have a voice at all. And so I just started putting together uh, a comps tracker where I analyzed 63 national and regional banks using uh, many key performance risk indicators, including the nine above. I scored all 63 banks against each other using the metrics. A lot of the Patreons were also asking for a live course to go through the tracker with them. And so what I did was I put on a course where I reviewed all of the key performance indicators for the banks. I applied those key performance indicators to the banks as we analyze them. And then I provide provided my ranking of the banks analyzed. And so you can get access to all of this at the higher tier of the Patreon. And from there, you'll get access to our monthly calls, our monthly special live courses like the banking course and the comp schedule. And I'll be adding more uh, types of companies to the comp schedules. I'll be adding insurance, retail, et cetera there. But also if you just want access to my uh, 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 securities tracker, well, you can get access to that at $5 a month. And in here, there's like Alibaba, a Alphabet, Apple, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There's tons of companies uh, that I track and I provide what I think is their intrinsic value. But of course, um, that's just a place to start. You guys ultimately have to decide what the intrinsic value of these companies are for yourself. And there's over 200 people that have joined us thus far. So take a try. Now, the other thing is Microsoft actually reported some pretty decent results. And in fact, I had to take up my estimates for the company. And I found that very fascinating in this environment where, you know, most companies are reporting lower revenues in uh, 2022 and 2023. And so if you've missed that video, you can get access to it right here.